Let's move to um, communication. So how do you communicate with both customers and employees? And um, not, not only want to talk about how and when you should communicate, but how often you should communicate. Yeah, th this is, uh, I think, one of the most legally fraught areas of incident response. And there's a little bit of a damned if you do, damned if you don't nature to post-incident communications. Um, I'll give you the easy answer first, and then explaining what that answer means is really tough. Yeah. You should communicate promptly um, with both customers and employees, and you should give them exactly as much information as they need and no more. Right. Um, what that means with respect to each incident and with respect to each customer can be really complex. Um, but that's sort of the principle that you should apply in each varying instance to try and get the right amount of communication to your customers and your employees at the right time. And are there any concerns, you know, kind of coming back to potentially having those listening ears on your systems on how you do those communications? Um, is it, do you put it in email? Do you, are there better or any coaching you can provide folks on the line? There can be, yeah. I, you know, depending on the nature of, of the um, of the attack, your usual communication system may not be available, or it may not be reliable. Right. And so, when that's the case, you you obviously need to have alternative means of communication. And this is something again to think about ahead of time and set out in your incident response plan, so everyone in the organization knows what communication platform they're going to use in the event that the primary platform is unavailable. Think of it as another kind of backup. You've backed up everything else. You need backups for your corporate communications as well. It's um it's interesting that you think about the two potentially even different sides of communication here because when we had our incident this past week, um, our vendor wasn't communicating at all, it's neither swiftly, neither about severity, and um and so as a as their customer, I was super frustrated and. Coming back to the question that I had asked before, and they just said, we're down, we're down, we're down. And I asked the one question was, can you build from backups? And they said, our backups were in our current system. And then I knew, oh, we need to come up with an independent solution. But the fact that I didn't even have that indication of severity, unfortunately, put me in a position where we just lost trust and said, we have to go find an independent solution because our path is the only path that's going to get us back up and running. Um, as guiding a small business about how can you indicate things like severity, but giving just enough information? Do you just say, can't provide the details, but at least let your customers know it's going to be a day. It's going to be three days, but directionally, so they know they have an opportunity to empower their customers to be able to find backup solutions. Yep. I, this, is, this is really, I think, one of the hardest problems um, one faces in incident response. And, and you have to work through it in each individual situation because it varies in the different situations. Sort of nested within, within sort of what notice do you provide to a customer are, are really two different issues. One is what notice are you legally required to provide to a customer? That may be as a function of state or federal law, if it's particularly sensitive data that's involved, or it may be as a result of a, of a contractual term that requires you to provide a certain degree of notice within within a certain time period. But in addition to that, Kate, as you mentioned, um, you know, so much of business is built on good communication with customers and customer trust. You have to think about whether you should communicate with your customer for, for business purposes as well. And then when you think about what to communicate, what you really want to communicate as, as your question emphasizes is, what the customer needs to understand and mitigate their own risk. And if you can include that in a communication, and again, not much more than that, that really gives your customer what they need to take their own actions with respect to their own network, to take their own actions with respect to their own business partners and contacts, to make sure that they're controlling the risk and controlling the damage um, that sort of spreads from the initial incident. And, and so that's the sweet spot you're looking for is giving them the information they need to respond and 
control their own risk without disclosing so much information or information you're so uncertain about that it may come back to bite you in the form of a lawsuit or that kind of thing. Right. It's, um, it, it's so important because, again, I'll go back to one of Ruby's examples. Um, I finally was escalating and escalating and escalating and just said, I just, I, I need you to give me more information. And they just kept saying, we've been up for 36 hours. We're trying to work this out. And I heard we, 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 and, and I literally got the, you should feel bad for us. And then I just said, I'm sorry, I need you to change your lens. I have 11,000 small business customers right now that are depending on me. You need to give me information. <laughs> like I need to empower them with an action plan. This is yep. not about you or I, this is about them. <laughs> and, uh, and the, then all of a sudden the conversation changed. So I would encourage anyone, if you find yourself um, at the unfortunate wrong end of a cyber attack is making sure you have that lens because None of our customers asked for this. And, and so we've got to make sure we're empowering them with enough ability to find a backup plan. I think that's absolutely right, Kate. And I hate to sound like a broken record on this, but it's so hard to see the, the, the scope of the storm and what's outside the storm when you're in the eye of it. Yes. And, and that's why it's so important to think about these things ahead of time. It's in the middle of a crisis is a terrible time to do crisis planning. Yeah. Um, and think about how you're going to communicate with your customers, what's important to them, what you'll need to communicate with them, all of those things ahead of time. So that when you're in the fog of the conflict and you're trying to respond to the incident and you've got a million and one things going on and you've got multiple customers reaching out for help at the same time, you've thought through that in advance. You know what your customers are going to need. You know how to be as helpful to them as you can under the circumstances, and you can get them the information they need as quickly as possible. That is great, great advice. So I want to wrap up with just how can we get our small businesses started assessing their risk? And we talked about a couple of paths, and one is the Let's start with the mindset of an incident response and all the steps that we would need to take. Is there a secondary path that maybe you run in parallel that says, do I need to bring in a specialist to even educate the entire organization on what are the risks and what is out there? And how do we even think about documenting our own environments and, and identifying the risk? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, Kate, I think as is true of so many business issues, the first and most important step is getting the right people around the table and focus on the problem, right? And so um, if you've got an incredibly capable and well-resourced internal team, it may be that you just need to get that internal team, which, which isn't just IT specialists anymore. Now it's IT specialists, risk managers, legal, HR, you know, PR, you need all of them around the table to understand the way an incident might impact your, your organization and how to respond to one effectively. If you get that group around the table and you think, you know, we really could use some additional expertise or some additional resources with respect to this, there's, a, there's an entire market out there of, of really good service providers that you can bring in to help with that. And that really, that really is, I think, the first step. And then looking at What's most, what about your systems and data is most important and most valuable to your business so you can think about what the potential threats and vulnerabilities are to it, how it needs to be protected, and how you get it back up again if it were taken down by an incident. Excellent advice, Todd. And I can't thank you enough. We really appreciate you taking your time, uh, particularly with your expertise and sharing it with our Ruby community. My pleasure, Kate.